Tonight on The Late Debate, don't level down London. The message from the mayor as the government unveils its railway expansion plans. Clipping the wings of London is not the answer if you want to help other cities and regions to soar. And the battle lines are drawn in Bexley. Will Slees cause a by-election upset? Good evening. The government has finally unveiled its rail investment plans, providing billions of pounds for schemes in the Midlands and the North. As the PM toured northern towns, promoting the plans, a more subdued Sadiq Khan told politicians at City Hall that levelling up the North could mean levelling down London's own transport network. It's an ambitious and unparalleled programme, a £96 billion programme, the largest single rail investment ever made by a UK government. Big money and big promises from the Transport Secretary, but none of it for London and the home counties. And this is why. We're about to embark on one of the biggest single acts of levelling up of any government in history. The Prime Minister made the case for levelling up in his speech to the Conservative conference last month. Levelling up works for the whole country and it is the right and responsible policy because it helps to take the pressure off parts of the overheating southeast while simultaneously offering hope and opportunity to those areas that have felt left behind. The government is determined to create an economic power base in the north to rival London and the southeast, but some politicians in the capital are very worried. Sadiq Khan warned today that Transport for London is planning cuts to tubes and buses if a long-term funding deal can't be agreed. I'm a big advocate for greater transport investment in regions of our country that have been neglected for far too long. But levelling up must not be about dragging down London and regions in the south of England. Clipping the wings of London is not the answer if you want to help other cities and regions to soar. The mayor released a series of images suggesting a return to the shabby tube network of the past. He is scaremongering and quite frankly it's a disgrace. They, they will go into proper negotiations. The government has already given him just shy of £4 billion. He knows full well that the government will do something but actually the government needs him to look at this properly and see where he can make proper savings. TfL's current temporary funding deal with the government runs out in just under a month. Treasury cash is heading north but London can't afford to be sidelined. Joining me now to talk through some of those issues for the Conservatives is the Thurrock MP, Jackie Doyle-Price, the Labour MP for Ealing North, James Murray, and for social distancing reasons from a nearby studio, the Liberal Democrat MP for Chesham and Amersham, Sarah Green. Welcome all of you. Uh, Jackie Doyle-Price, Sadiq Khan's got a point, hasn't he, with money disappearing up north, the south east is being levelled down? I don't think so at all. To be honest, I think we've had decades of London-centric policy making, and it's time that actually the whole of the country, we are one nation. Uh, and that just because more resources going to the north doesn't mean London is going to lose out. But ultimately, we do have a situation where more growth is happening in London and the South East than the rest of the country. That's been happening for years. And the only way that we're going to change that is by investing in public infrastructure. So you agree with the Prime Minister that it's overheating? Uh, it has been. Yeah, I mean, if you, if you look at our housing need, for example, and look at where we're going to try and, try and build, then that's hugely difficult. Uh, and we've got you know, ho whole swathes of the rest of the country that's crying out for investment and growth. We now have communications which allow people to work remotely, so we should be spreading, spreading the proceeds of growth, as but we But is, is there any suggestion that people who want houses in London and the South East are prepared to move up to the North? Well, it's more than the case that for decades, younger people have been having to move to London and the South East to work. And, you know, I would like the positions where we can actually sustain those uh, communities in the north by investing and making opportunity available there. But it shouldn't be seen as a competition. You know, we all benefit as a nation if the whole of the nation is all enjoying those, those growth opportunities. James, London's big enough, old enough, strong enough to stand up for itself, isn't it? I think we need investment in a modern, sustainable uh, transport system right across the country. Um, and actually today what we saw is the government breaking its promises about HS2 and the Northern uh, Powerhouse Rail, um, but at the same time playing politics uh, with the future of transport in London. And, you know, a lot of people across the country rightly say they want a London-style transport system in different parts of the country. But there's a real risk of a London-style transport system coming to an end in London itself. 
uh, because if the government can't come up with the money and a sustainable funding package for transport in London, um, there's going to be huge cuts to it. It's going to start declining and that's going to have a knock-on impact not only for London's economy but for the economy of the whole country. Do you hear from your constituents that they're worried about money going to red wall seats? I think people want to see investment in our local area. People care first and foremost about the local area, but also people realise that across the country there's been a real lack of investment um, in services of all sorts, but particularly in public transport, and that's what's needed in every part of the country now. Sarah, one of the byproducts of today's announcement was that uh, the government has cancelled the HS2 link from Nottingham to Leeds. Now, you won your seat partly on the back of opposition to HS2 in Buckinghamshire. Are you green with envy that they've managed to get rid of it? Well, I'm not green with envy, but I have been contacted by people who feel insulted that um, the, the tunnelling that's currently taking place in, in the Chilterns is seemingly for nothing. Because if you remember, the economic case for HS2 was predicated on the entire network being built. And if some of that network isn't being built, then all of that pain feels like it's for nothing. So what would you say to the, to the, the government now? slow down, get rid of HS2 altogether? Uh, it's too far gone, isn't it? Well, I, I personally have never been a fan of HS2, and I think the constituents of Cheshire and Amersham would quite like to see it stop. But uh, I would like to just raise um, something that, that, that you've just mentioned about transport in London. My, my big fear for, for both Chesham and Amersham is the Metropolitan Line, because they do look... They have been increasingly suffering from from delays and suspended um, services and I'm, I'm really fearful for what that if, if there's if there's budget cuts coming for TFL what that means for both Chesham and Amersham branch lines of, of the Metropolitan Line and and I hope I hope that they will be saved. Is Sadiq Khan right to to sound the alarm as he did today about what could happen to transport in London? Well of course he is because he's there to represent London and, and he's there to fight for London and fight for London's resources but equally we have leaders up and down the country who are also making the case and it's for government to make decisions as to where we get more bang for our buck and on the issue of HS2 again I think one of the issues is we take so long to build these uh, projects that quite often the need alters in the meantime between you know the original plan and actually coming to delivery and the truth is that HS2 was designed on improving spokes into London when actually we do need more connectivity between towns and cities in the north and that's what this plan delivers. You represent a constituency Thurrock outside London in Essex a lot of your constituents travel into London are they worried about what's happening with TfL? I think generally my constituents worry about the state of the trains and state of C2C uh, and, and that line and they often are uh, impacted by what happens in London. There is obviously, you know, we, we have a border with Greater London, but frankly, when it comes to transport, there's no border at all because we're all using the same services. So there is always generally a worry, not just about um, uh, train infrastructure, but also about roads too. James, we heard Susan Hall from the London Assembly Conservatives describe what Sadiq Khan warned today of this massive managing declining cutbacks up to the transport system. Uh, it is sabre rattling, isn't it? No, I think it's being absolutely straight with people about how serious this is. You know, we have a real risk to our own London style transport system here in London if the investment doesn't come forward from the government. You know, it's, it's worth bearing in mind that the transport system in London is hugely reliant on fares revenue. Over 70% of, of the income for TfL comes from fares. Compare that to a city like New York, where it's only about 38% uh, comes from fares. So the impact of COVID, with passenger ridership going down so much, has been enormous. Now, the government needs to support the transport system in London to make sure the economy in London keeps going, and thereby the economy in the rest of the UK prospers as well. So, Sarah, if you were in government, what would you be doing to, to save the Metropolitan Line to Chesham and Amersham? Well, I think it's, it's important to look at where the, the service demand is. And um, the key thing about both of those two branches that I was just talking about is that they are the, the lifeline into work and into school. There is no other service. You know, once you take them away, there's, there is no alternative. And that's, that's where I think the important thing to remember is that if you take something away, what are you replacing it with? And I personally don't think you should take either of those branch lines away. James, we saw Sadiq Khan at Mayor's Question Time today. That was the last Mayor's Question Time at the current City Hall, which he's moving east. Mm. You used to work there as his Deputy Mayor for Housing. Mm. Are you sad to see it close? I think there's a little twinge of nostalgia, but I do recognise the financial situation and uh, the huge black hole in the GLA budget, and so the need to move out is a way of protecting money for frontline services. Um, I think what I would also say uh, is that in my old role uh, there, I used to spend quite a lot of time 
uh, in the Royal Docks, um, and it's an area that I, I know quite well uh, because of spending time there. And actually, I think this is a real opportunity uh, to bring uh, some an extra boost to the regeneration in, in the area. You know, you go to the Royal Docks, you've got the beautiful docks themselves, the, the ship loaders, the view over Canary Wharf and into the city. You know, it's a really exciting area where we can get a lot of new homes and new jobs um, over the next couple of decades. And I think City Hall moving there can be a real force for good. OK. Now, last night, the Prime Minister faced backbench MPs furious over his handling of the Owen Paterson case and the resulting row over second jobs. Boris Johnson admitted he had crashed the car, but the question worrying his party is how much damage will be done at the ballot box. The first test of that will come in the Old Bexley and Sidcup by-election. In a corner of south-east London, voters are being bombarded by politicians knocking on their doors and offering them leaflets. I'm the Liberal Democrat candidate standing right. in the by-election. Hello, Genghis. With a parliamentary by-election just two weeks away, the political spotlight has fallen on Old Bexley and Sidcup. On a campaign visit last week, the Prime Minister was asked if the row over Slees could cost him the seat. No, because I think that uh, Louis French is running a, a very positive campaign. Louis French is the Conservative candidate. He's a local councillor. How many voters are mentioning Tory Slees? Not many, to be completely honest. Um, a lot of people are focusing on the local issues. They, they, they realise that I'm not connected in any way to what's been going on in Westminster. You know, we have conversations about these local issues that I'm fully focused on supporting and, and solving, hopefully. That's not the experience of Labour's candidate, who claims voters are angry about MPs having two jobs. It is beginning to cut through. You know, I've had several people talk to me um, about first-hand experience, I had a nurse speak to me about they haven't got the time to fill the vacancies on my walls and I'm on my knees every night, yet they've got time to take second jobs. Um, so it is really beginning to come through in the mood of the people out there on the doorstep. The by-election follows the death of the former Cabinet Minister James Brokenshaw, who had cancer. His majority in this slice of the London commuter belt was almost 19,000. Old Bexley and Sidcup has always been a Tory stronghold. But a by-election in Buckinghamshire six months ago showed that even seemingly safe seats can change hands. The Liberal Democrat candidate hopes she can repeat her party's success in Chesham and Amersham. People are saying that it seems to be one rule for them, one rule for us. People are fed up. But realistically, you can't win this, can you? I think we can win it. I mean, in 2019... You third last time. Well, 2019, when I stood as the parliamentary candidate here, I did increase our vote share. The Green Party's candidate has also encountered disillusioned Tory voters. The concern that uh, it seems to be that the, the government is looking after its own rather than actually focusing on what the people need, what, what the public needs. All of the candidates will be trying to win over Old Bexley and Sidcup's swing voters. I'm very open to who I vote for this time. I'm indecided, I really can't decide. I normally make my own decision at the last minute. We are undecided yet, aren't we? We'll vote Conservative because we always have done so. Might go Labour this time, I don't know. I used to be Conservative, but I'm not sure. The voters of Old Bexley and Sidcup will make up their minds two weeks today. And there are a total of 11 candidates standing in the Old Bexley and Sidcup by-election. Polls are open from 7am until 10pm on Thursday, December the 2nd. The list of candidates is also available on our website. Now, Jackie and James, I know you've both been campaigning in Old Bex in Sidcup. Do you get a feeling for how it's going? I, I would never predict a by-election, if I'm brutally honest, because I think quite often uh, people decide uh, very late in the day. It's not like when you choose a government and people go into a general election campaign with a very clear view about who they want to lead the country. With the by-elections, the opportunity to send a message. And uh, I think after the last two weeks, I'd be less confident, but there's two more weeks to go. So. James, what sense did you get down there? Um, so I was down there on Wednesday morning um, and it was, it was noticeable how several people unprompted on the doorstep um, said to me, oh, you know, I might have been Tory before, but with this Boris Johnson or this Slees and so on, you know, there's a general kind of stench of Slees coming through. And I think that is feeding through on the ground and impacting people's um, decisions. You know, we've got a very a positive campaign with our, our candidate, Daniel Francis, uh, who's well known in the local area. Um, and I think when people see the Slees they associate with the Conservatives uh, nationally and then a good local candidate like Daniel, uh, people might be shifting their voting intentions. You're shaking your head, Jackie. I'm, I'm shaking my head because actually when it comes to Slees, I don't think voters uh, differentiate between any political party, to be frank. Uh, we, we happen to be I in government. <laughs> we happen to be in government now, but I think generally, and, and this, the expense scandal showed, it was all MPs that reached opprobrium from that. So that's why I say I think you know, there is the opportunity for a protest if this continues. 
Sarah, during your by-election earlier this year, Ed Davies seemed to move into Chesham and Amersham. Uh, I think he made a dozen visits during the campaign. I don't think he's been seen yet in uh, Old Bexley and Sidcup. Have the Lib Dems written it off? I, uh, well, I know that, that our candidate, Simone Reynolds, has been campaigning really hard. I know how passionate she, she feels about the, the local health services there. But the thing I would say to the good people of, of Bex, Bexley and Old Sidcup is, in the last two weeks, brace yourselves for an avalanche of leaflets through your letterbox because because I think that was the one refrain I remember having um, a few months back from 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 my by-election that the amount of literature that went through the letterboxes was was noted. Jackie you were one of the Tory rebels in the Owen Patterson vote what sense do you get from your constituents of the anger that this has caused? Well I, I, as I say we, we've, we've had now for, for a number of years whenever these stories come out people just tar everyone uh, with the same but brush. But you don't think this is different? I don't think this is different, no, I don't think it's different, but you know, I, I think what what we fail to do, and, and, and to be honest, you know, I, I want to just make the case for MPs, because most of us actually do comply by the rules, most of us are motivated to do the right thing, and what saddens me is that when we have an episode like this, the public just decide a plague on all your houses, and actually, you know, I think all three of us would, would have gone into politics for the right reasons, and I don't think generally parliamentarians deserve to be as traduced as they are. What's going wrong at number 10? <laughs> um, I, I, I mean, ultimately, I think what, what happened in this case was that there was well-intentioned motivation to support a colleague who'd gone through difficulty. Um, it was quite short-termist in how it played out, to be honest, and it was, it's been a big mistake. I'm pleased the Prime Minister has now acknowledged that, uh, and that's actually the first start to moving on and actually getting a system that people can be confident in. You weren't at that 1922 meeting last night, but do you I sense the, the Prime Minister's got a bit tone deaf? Um, I'm not so sure it's that. I mean, let's be honest, we've had COVID, we've had MPs not around Parliament, so the opportunities for, for ministers and for the Prime Minister particularly to hear from colleagues just hasn't been there. So I don't think necessarily that the leadership is entirely in touch with what backbench MPs think, but I think they've learned a lesson this week. Sarah, can I just ask you, on a personal note, what's it like being a by-election candidate in the eye of the storm? It is a bit of a whirlwind, and I think um, it's it's not real life um, and I think Jackie's right that, that people do treat it slightly differently to a general election and so um, I wouldn't be surprised if 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 we did see a protest in in this particular um, by-election it's 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 interesting to, to how people are willing to open up to you on the doorstep um, in a way that they, I, I mean, I've campaigned in many elections, but it, it's it's interesting how people are willing to open up when, as Jackie says, it's it's a slightly different sort of election. But it's it's a whirlwind. It really is. James, uh, Labour came second last time in Old Bexley and Sidcup, but the Tories have three times as many votes, so it's a it's a tough ask for you. What would be a good result for Sir Keir Starmer? I'm not going to start predicting uh, what the outcome of the by-election is. I'm not sure anything good comes of me making a guess on that front, but all I can talk about is my personal experience having been there on Wednesday. And as I say, there are people who uh, might have voted Tory before, but now thinking again. OK, let's uh, talk about another story that's been around for the last couple of weeks, Nazanin Zaghari Ratcliffe mm -hmm. and Richard Ratcliffe's hunger strike, which ended last weekend. Uh, yesterday in the Public Liaison Committee, Jeremy Hunt, the Chairman of the Health uh, committee, former Foreign Secretary, suggested that one way round the problem with Iran is to pay off this £400 million debt by getting round the, the, the international sanctions on banking and send the money to Iran by another way. But if you can't use a bank to repay it for, for various reasons, uh, why can't we do what President Obama did in January 2016 and take fly over a crate of cash to Tehran and just repay that debt? Well, uh, it's, it's certainly worth uh, worth considering, but, but as, you, as, as you know, these are these are uh, there are complexities attached. So, not exactly uh, not a, uh, throwing the idea around. What do you think? I mean, essentially, we we we. This is an absolutely terrible, terrible situation, uh, but it requires a diplomatic solution. And you know, I know that uh, obviously Richard Ratcliffe met with the Foreign Secretary and uh, you know, he, he continues to try and draw attention to this as best he can. It's awful, absolutely awful. I think the, what the Prime Minister said there is, is actually an indication that the government is thinking of every tool that they can use to apply pressure and ultimately Iran is behaving badly. 
I think, as if, I, if I'm right and uh, if I'm remembering correctly, what Jeremy said is, you know, this is not a ransom, but it's about doing what's right. And I think the Defence Secretary has acknowledged that this debt is owed. And so the government uh, should do everything they can to resolve this as soon as possible. Um, you know, I, I went down to meet Richard um, during uh, near the beginning of his hunger strike. And, you know, you can see in his face um, this um, exhaustion, but this real determination um, you know, and it should inspire all of us, you know, including the Foreign Secretary and the Prime Minister, to do everything they possibly can to get Nazanin and the other British nationals home. Sarah, the government has a long-standing policy of not uh, giving in to hostage-taking. What do you think should happen? Well, this isn't hostage-taking. Like, like, like James has said, this is a debt that is owed and we should pay it. But I, I also went to see Richard Ratcliffe and I've been following Nazanin's case for years. I think anyone who's a, a member of Amnesty International can't fail to follow her her plight. And, and the thing that struck me when I went to see Richard was that he was surrounded by pumpkins because his daughter had been there pumpkin carving. And that's, that's what tugs at the heartstrings here, is that this is a family that has been torn apart. And the government really should do everything it can to bring her home. Nobody seems to disagree on on that, that something should be done, but somehow or other the government so doesn't seem to be able to, to make any movement. I well, mean, I mean, you know, that, those questions came from Jeremy Hunt, and when Jer Jeremy was Foreign Secretary, I don't think anyone can doubt his determination to try and get a solution to this, and he failed. So, you know, we, we are in a, we're in a very difficult diplomatic solution, and it's, it's very easy for us to sit here in the studio and, and invent a solution, but actually we're dealing with negotiations with a hostile foreign power. And James, You've, you've, Labour's made it clear that the money should just be paid, but isn't that just going to encourage more of the same? Um, well, as I said, it's not so much paying a ransom, it's not engaging in hostage diplomacy, but the Defence Secretary and others have acknowledged this debt is owed uh, and show the government should uh, sort it out as quickly as possible. And I, th I think there's a lot of people um, advocating uh, for that to happen now. And, you know, I think the, the real sense I get from the government is that this just is not a priority for the Prime Minister and the Foreign Secretary. And that's desperately sad. Um, and it should be. It should be an absolute top priority to get Nazanin and the other British nationals home. It is a priority, surely. Absolutely, of course it is. But again, we are we are actually you know, dealing with dealing with a foreign government, uh, and it needs a diplomatic solution. But you can see the 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 efforts that Jeremy undertook as is, is a case in point. He didn't succeed. I wouldn't I wouldn't assume that this is not a priority for this prime minister and foreign secretary because I know it is. Okay, well, we've run out of time as usual. Thank you to all my guests tonight, to James, Jackie and Sarah, but most of all, thank you all for watching. I'll be back with our last show of the year, which is next month, but for the moment, from all of us here on The Late Debate and from my guests, thank you for watching and good night. <laughs>